Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. I felt it in the hymns, music. I felt it in the prayers for the exciting mission opportunities done, ongoing, and coming. <laughs> Shoot, fire! I'm glad to be here today. <laughs> Oh, man, a fresh touch from God. How do we need that? Those of you who may not be uh, preachers may not understand this, but I, I think maybe you will. Many of us who study the Bible all of our lives, uh, when we get ready to present, preach, teach, we have done the exegetical work, the hard work, the work in the text, in the languages, and we come to a time now we say, Now, Lord, how do I present this? Uh, how do I introduce this? How do I structure this? It's been amazing to me through the years. It doesn't happen every Sunday. Sometimes it doesn't happen every month. Uh, but when it does, it's so exciting for someone like me. Is um, You get ready and, and uh, you ask the Spirit to, uh, to flow through you. And it's like a... Um, it's like an outline appears in my mind. Just the, the, the text begins to organize itself in, the, in overarching themes and in the illustrations and examples. I just can't tell you how exciting it is. And I've got one today. And it's the second paragraph of 1 Peter 2. Now, as you know, paragraphs are not inspired. And... Um, there is some disagreement among translations of whether it begins in the three or four. Um, I'm going to begin in four. I think of four through ten is what I want to do. Now, it's going to take me a minute to introduce this. Um, uh, quite often, as a Bible teacher, uh, as I'm doing on Sunday nights, I go to a text and I try to bring out the word meaning, the unique grammatical features, the... Uh, immediate context, any kind of related theological themes, that's, that's what teachers do. But there come those times when instead of the microscope of exegesis, the telescope presents itself. And overarching biblical themes begin to make sense of all the small text and even individual books. Uh, I feel like that's what's happened this morning. I've entitled this, The New Temple and the New Priesthood. I want you to think with me now. Beginning in Exodus 25, all the way through the book of Leviticus, Moses says that God presented him a pattern for the tabernacle. Now, the tabernacle was a portable tent that went with the people of God during the judgment years of the wilderness wanderings. Although it was a judgment event, God was never so close to his people. And the rabbis look back and say this was a honeymoon between God and his children. Their shoes never wore out. Their clothes grew miraculously. Water came whenever necessary. Uh, the, the, the wild birds dropped on the camp. From Oh, God was uniquely there. The symbol, Shekinah cloud of his presence and the tabernacle. The tabernacle was a holy God's way to maintain fellowship with an unholy people. And sacrifice, the sacrifice of innocent animals, substituted for the deserved death of rebellious sinners. The soul that sins, it will surely die. And God allowed innocent animals to take that penalty. And sacrifice and the tabernacle, later the temple, became a way for a holy God to uniquely dwell amongst a people of unclean lips. <laughs> but a terrible thing happened. The people of God began to focus on the ritual, on the liturgy, on the calendar. They would do the meticulous commands of the cultists of Israel, but somehow lost the 
intimacy of a personal relationship and personal faith with God. They were religious, but they had lost the purpose of the religion. The goal of the Bible is the restoration of the intimate fellowship of the Garden of Eden damaged in the rebellion of Adam and Eve. So the tabernacle and the temple were a way to reunite that fellowship in a symbolic way. But as the people of God begin to focus on the details instead of the God of the covenant, terrible things happened. Now to to try to show you how terrible this became, I want to read for a moment out of uh, Jeremiah chapter 7. This is Jeremiah's famous temple sermon. And uh, it, just let me read for a, for a few verses. I, I won't read a long one. I think just about 11 verses is all I'm going to read. But listen, don't turn, just listen. The impact is meant to be oral. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all you of Judah who enter by these gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Amend your ways and your deeds, and I will let you dwell in this place. Do not trust in deceptive words, saying, This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. If you amend your ways and your deeds, if you truly practice justice between a man and his neighbor, if you do not oppress the alien, the orphan, the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, nor walk after other gods to your own ruin, then I will let you dwell in this place, in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. Behold, you are trusting in deceptive words to no avail. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, and offer sacrifices to the Baals, and walk after other gods that you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this house? Oh, my. Stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered, that you may do all these abominations. Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your sight? Behold, I, even I, have seen it, declares the Lord. Now, you know, Jeremiah... The false prophets were saying, God will never let Jerusalem fall. God will never let Jerusalem fall. Quoting Isaiah. And Jeremiah said, you forgot this is a conditional covenant. You can't live godless lives and run to a house that's called by my name and think you will escape by killing a few animals, offering a little incense, and coming on certain days. So the temple that was meant to be a mechanism for a holy God to accept and maintain fellowship with his people became the very barrier to that fellowship. This is exactly why Israel missed the coming of Christ. They were so focused on their lineage from Abraham and the Mosaic covenant focused in the temple that they missed the powerful new message in Jesus of Nazareth. Now this, this new temple I think is exemplified in Jesus cleansing the temple. Now I don't have time today to talk about the synoptic gospels, the last week of Jesus' life where he cleansed it, or very early in John, John chapter 2, where either it's a literary technique or there are two cleansings. At this point, I'm not sure which I really understand, but I know this, that Jesus stepped in to the cultic center of the people of God and disrupted it and brought attention by quoting this very verse in Jeremiah that his, his house and the area of the Gentiles, which was meant to be a place for the coming of the nations to Yahweh, had been turned in to a manipulative financial structure of the high priest. So Jesus says, and you can see it either in Matthew 24, where the disciples are looking at this beautiful temple that Herod had built 46 years in the building. 
And Jesus said, not one stone will be left upon another. Or you can go to some of the trials, particularly the trial before Herod, where false witnesses are brought in that quote Jesus' words earlier in his ministry, probably quoted several times, and accuse Jesus of promising to destroy the temple and in three days build it again. Now, I wish you would turn with me here to John chapter 2, beginning in verse 18 through 22. Now, this is the, the first cleansing. The Jews are looking for a sign. Let me pick up at John 2, 18 through 22. The Jews therefore answered and said to him, What sign do you show us, seeing that you do these things? And Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And the Jews therefore said, It took 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken to them. Now that's the background to what I want to do today in 1 Peter chapter 2. So if you turn with me there, 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, beginning in verse 4. It's amazing to me how much Peter quotes the Old Testament and applies it to the church. Now you, He'll do it several times. And of course he's following Paul that does the same thing. And coming to him, now I want to, I want to, I want to say that again. Now, some translations make it an imperative. Come to him. I think the Greek text is an indicative. Coming to him, it's a participle. Um, do you note the personal element here? You see, the tragedy is that people across the world may be gathered in buildings that have scripture on the front or choirs in the back, pews in the middle, but somehow they don't come to him. The essence of biblical faith is not where we are, but whose we are. The essence of biblical faith is that we have an intimate, dynamic, growing, self-sacrificing, personal relationship with God in Christ. It is an intimacy factor. And religion can be a bridge and an aid, but it can be a barrier and a substitute. And the tragedy is religious people, tragedy without an intimacy with the personal God. You say, well, how, how do you know it's, it's not real? When Sunday is the essence of the relationship, it's not real. Because intimacy is a daily intimacy. Monday is as holy as Sunday, and your garage is as holy as this building or your workplace. Come to Him. Coming to Him. Now we're, now we're going to use a phrase to describe Jesus. This is not what they do, it's what He has done. Coming to Him as to a living stone. Oh, I have a living stone? What is that all about? Well, being an Old Testament professor has helped me tremendously in interpreting the New Testament. God is often called a rock. A good place would be Psalm 18, the first couple of verses. He called a rock and a fortress and a mighty tower. These are all metaphors for either the, the strength of the mountains, God, Mount Sinai, God came from Mount Seir, God came from Mount Paran, the, the mountain in the north. Oh, all these, all these Old Testament verses about God and the mountains. And then, Daniel chapter 2, a series of kingdoms are going to follow Nebuchadnezzar, world empires of the ancient Near East. And the fifth kingdom is a rock hewn out of the mountain without human hands that strikes the image in the foot and destroys human world empires. It's a messianic, messianic picture of the Messiah, a rock. But this is something different than that. It's not just the imagery of the strength of the mountains, the permanency of the mountains. It's not even the, the Daniel 2 imagery of the rock. This is the imagery of the temple. These are stones, hewn stones, 
special stones, building. This is a construction metaphor. Peter has moved from a metaphor of the pure milk of the word, nursing mother, to a metaphor of construction. And the item of construction is the central focus of Jewish worship, the temple. And what's going to happen is that Jesus is going to become the central structure of Jewish worship, not a building. Follow with me. This stone, this living stone, rejected by men, but chosen or elect and precious in the sight of God. So we got a metaphor of a, a stone, a building stone. But for some reason, this stone is rejected by men. And yet this stone is the key to this spiritual building. Now we're, we're about to start quoting Old Testament text. And these Old Testament texts are going to come from Isaiah and the Psalms. So Peter is going back, looking at the flow of Jewish history, and notice what he's going to come to. You also are living stones, are being built into a spiritual house for a holy priesthood. Now, not only is Jesus going to be the new temple, but the children of God are going to replace the Levites. I don't know how many times the unique blessings of the Levites, example, the Levites' inheritance is not land. The Levites' inheritance is the Lord. And now in the New Testament, the Lord is the inheritance of all believers. We have taken the place of that special tribe chosen to uniquely minister to the Lord. As a matter of fact, the Levites were chosen out of judgment. You remember it was Simeon and Levi that killed all the men at Shechem and Jacob in Genesis 49 said both tribes would be dispersed. Simeon dispersed in Judah, disappeared. Levi dispersed throughout the land as local teachers and some in the temple. It was a judgment scene and yet they became a symbol of intimacy with God. So now the people of God become the new priesthood because Jesus has become the new temple. It's a radical new thought. A new thought that would really upset those who are focused in on liturgy and calendars and where do you worship the Lord and how do you do it in the exact way. It's a new way of thinking about a relationship with God. And you are living stones are being built up into a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. What is that spiritual sacrifice? You go back to chapter 1. It's the, it's the holy living. It's the holy ones, holy ones. It's that we're a different people. It, or if you go to Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, lay yourself on the altar of God as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. You see, reasonable service is not attendance at a building. Reasonable service is not a calendar event of coming on Christmas and Easter. Spiritual service is life given to God. Life to be lived for Him. Life at His direction. Because if it is true that New Testament salvation is a reversal of the fall, if the fall is what's in it for me, self-centered then salvation is what's in it for you, God, selflessness. So what we have here is a reversal of the fall in the way that we live, not where we go periodically. Appropriate spiritual sacrifice. Then this quote from Isaiah 28, 16. I lay in Zion a choice stone. Now the choice stone picks back up on the choice or elect and precious in the sight of God, living stone of Jesus Christ. This choice stone. He who believes in him shall not be ashamed or disappointed. Um, we haven't developed the metaphor yet, but we're getting close to the ideal of whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord text. Do you know there's a word that there's the concept of whosoever? Do you catch that when it says he who believes is a is a universal thrust, uh, whoever will, as many as, all. Do you catch the thrust of that that's in this text? And of course, believe is crucial. 
Believe is not mental assent to doctrine. Believe is not mental assent to doctrine. Salvation is not a creed to be signed. Salvation is a life to be lived. Salvation is a call to Christ's likeness, not some future mansion on a hill. Salvation affects time as well as eternity. We already are the living stones of a new priesthood. And it has nothing to do with Sunday. It has to do with life. It has to do with daily. It has to do with Christ-likeness. We have preached a cheap gospel that turns Christianity into a decision in the past and a building to go to every now and then. Exactly the problem of the Jewish nation. Verse 7. This precious value then is for you who believe. But, here's the contrast, for those who disbelieve. You mean there's going to be those? I think of John 3.16. The John 3.16 is a blessing and a curse. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The implication is strong and true that for those who do not believe, there is no eternal life. I mean, it, 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 it is a, you've got to choose A or B here. Uh, there is a decisive choice that must be made. And that choice is, who is Jesus Christ? Those who believe in him will never be disappointed. Double negative, strong affirmation. But for those who do not, now watch this. We're going back to the stone again. The stone which the builders rejected, we're continuing in the construction metaphor, has become the very corner stone. Now, I do not know exactly what stone this is about. There are several verses in the Old Testament. There are three key verses in, in imagery about a building. One, and I haven't seen it here, but I'm sure it's out front. When y'all built this building, you probably put a stone that says who was the pastor and maybe who was the chairman of the committee and the deacon chairman and a date when this building was built. It's usually, it's usually on one of the front corners on the side. That is the first stone laid. And every other stone fits into that pattern. That could be what Jesus is talking about. There's another stone called the capstone that is the last stone put in place, the last stone on the last corner. There is a third option of a stone that comes right in the middle of the arch that carries the weight of the entire wall on this one stone. Whichever key stone we're talking about, this is saying that the key to a relationship with God is a relationship with His Son. And what happened to religious people in all of their don'ts, in all of their do's, in all of their comes, in all of their be, is they miss the intimate personal relationship with the only one that makes a difference. So the stone, whichever stone it is, that was meant to be in the wonderful house of God, rejected by the builders, ignored by the builders, is now sitting in the middle of the road, which is a metaphor for lifestyle faith. And those who do not believe are on this road. Oh, it's a wide road. <laughs> it's a wide road. It looks really like a good road. And many there are that are on this road. But in that road, there is a large rock. And that rock is the living stone of Jesus Christ. And with all of our religiosity, if we miss him, we've missed everything. And religious people stumble over the stone, the cornerstone, that special stone of God, that special one, the very essence of knowing God. When he's rejected, there is no relationship with God. If you have the Son, you have life. If you do not have the Son, you do not have life. 1 John 5. So another quote here. This one from Psalm 118.22. Then in verse 8, another quote, Isaiah 8.14. And the stone of stumbling and the rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word. And this doom they were also appointed. Now, Peter is picking up, as, as Jewish people of the first century do, on word plays. Do you remember last week, in chapter 1, verse 22, through chapter 2, verse 2, 
this imagery of born again with an imperishable seed. And that seed was identified as the eternal word of God. Scripture, revelation. L- look, look at the play there. It, it, it's in verse uh, 23. It's, it's in verse um, 2. This special word. Now, what is this word? Well, it's the preached gospel of the apostles. In context, it can be nothing else. They're falling over the preached gospel. Gentiles are upset about one thing. Jews are upset about another thing. I I listen to the religiosity of postmodern Western world. Oh, we are a spiritual religious people. We, We will worship pyramids. We will go to ancient stones. <laughs> we, we will look into, into the planets aligning. We will do anything and everything. We'll go to palm readers. We'll go to horoscope. We are searching for spirituality, but we've fallen over the stone. Religious without life. Moral without a compass. What we don't do will never bring us to God. What we do will never bring us to God. The only thing that will bring us to God is that living stone. Whosoever believes in Him will not be disappointed. Whosoever believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. This is the eternal Word of God. We ignore it at our peril. And we cannot compromise with a world who's missed the stone because this is our message. Jesus is the only way to God, period. There is no other way. The greatest trickster of our generation may be Oprah Winfrey. Now you've got to start deciding all the stuff you hear in God's name and about spiritual things. Where do we go for the source of our authority? Our authority is in two places. The living word of God and the written word of God. There is no other authority. And yet people are confused. People don't know what to do. And the reason they're confused is because they're getting mixed messages from the living stones. And that's us. we got to know what we believe and why. We've got to be immersed in the Word. we got to live what we believe. And the world will take notice. And until we live... I noticed in your psalms today a lot about living the holy life. I am not a rule-oriented people. To me, holiness is not the abundance of things I don't do. To me, holiness is the number of things I do for the kingdom of God in love. Oh, my. Now, you say, what about this? They were appointed for doom. Well, you might want to go to uh, Romans 9.22. I I certainly believe there are proof texts for Calvinism in the Bible. And one of them comes when God blinds the eyes of Israel, cut off the natural branches, that the non-wild branches may be grafted in, which is the Gentiles. Now, the purpose of the new graft is that eventually the old graft will come back. But there is no coming back without Christ. May I say that again? There's no coming back without faith in Christ. I still pray for Zechariah 12.10 for my Jewish friends and fellow citizens. For until they look on Him whom they have pierced and grieve as over the loss of the only Son, there is no salvation outside Jesus Christ. Whether in Judaism, in a temple, in a pyramid are, in quote, spiritual thinking. And then in verse 9 and 10, which really becomes another paragraph in in many translations, but you, here's the strong contrast, but you, you're different. Something's different in you. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. Now, this is a composite quote. It is very, very similar to the key words In Exodus 19, 5 and 6, as Moses brought the people of God before the mountain of God, wherever that is, Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, God is coming down to give the Ten Commandments. 
And this is the place he calls them by these wonderful names. But it's not exactly like this. It may be a composite quote from Exodus 19 and Deuteronomy 10, even maybe a possibility Isaiah 40 thrown in. It's a composite quote. But notice that these Old Testament titles for the people of God are now given to the church. And to back that up, would you look at verse 10, which is an allusion to Hosea chapters 1 and 2, where the two, two of the three names of Hosea's children are used to say, Lo Ruamah, I will not have compassion on you, and Lo Ami, you are not my people. But then in chapter 2, the mercy of God returns and they are his people and he does have mercy. But look who, who Peter is applying this text to. Those in northern Turkey who were the recipients of First Peter. Yes, there were certainly Jews in some of these churches. Many of these churches were probably started by Jews who heard the gospel at Pentecost. But many of these churches had Gentiles. You see, I could say it boldly. Gentile and Jew has absolutely no meaning anymore. Have you read Galatians 3? Have you read Acts 15? It doesn't matter who your mother is. It matters if you know that stone. It matters where your faith is put. If faith is put in mama or faith is put in nation, I hope you'll read John 8, 31 through 59. A lot of Jews thought they were right with God because of who their mother was. And Jesus dealt with that. Or some of these Jews believe because of this temple. I killed this animal. I killed it in the right way. I put the blood in the right place. I did it on the right day. Now you let me in. And the point is that the sacrificial system was always a system of faith plus, not ritual only. It was always a covenant relationship with. It always implied an intimate love. You brought your best animal to die. You came out of joy to your God. Not a symbol of I don't, I don't. Did I do one, two, three rights of the right day? Did I say the right thing? Sounds almost like Religious sacramentalism, and that's what it is. A trust in an event or a liturgy instead of an intimacy with the God of Scripture. A new temple. Jesus is the new temple. We are the new priesthood. Friends, this is a radical reorienting of the Old Testament message. This is a radical readjustment of the promises to national Israel. First Peter does it over and over and over and over again, and Paul does it numerous times. So the question is, are you religious or are you a new priest? The question is, is your faith in what you do or don't do, or is your faith in him who died in your place. And notice where it says here, what what is this all about? Why are we called a priesthood? That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Are you in darkness today? Are you in confusion? What are you trusting in? Or have you come to the place, we can just go back just a minute, chapter 2, verse 3. Have you tasted the kindness of the Lord? We are called to serve, not to get, but to give. We are called to die. We are called to live for Him and not for ourselves. Why? Because we've tasted the kindness of the Lord and because we are to proclaim the excellencies of Him who called us out of darkness into light. Remember one of those quotes this morning. Who has transferred us from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of His beloved Son. Are you in the kingdom of His beloved Son? Are you in the religiosity of a Western shallow culture? There's a new temple. It has nothing to do with dead goats, bulls, sheep, and and doves. It has to do with a lamb slain, before the foundation of the world. 
It has to do with behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. It has to do with the stone that the builders rejected that has now become the head of the corner. Do you know Him? May we stand together, please.